Okay. So thank you very much, colleagues, for uh, joining this afternoon or morning, maybe for you or evening for our colleagues in the uh, Philippines. And uh, welcome to today's webinar on human rights education in humanitarian settings. This webinar is organized by the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights Engagement Task Team, which is co-led jointly by UNHCR, Sokagakai International, represented by Elisa, who will be moderating today's event, as well as Aizaya, who is here with us today, representing the World Luther Lutheran Federation. For us, uh, human rights education is really an important element and actually a key pillar of the task team in our action plan. And today's event mark, I would say, beginning of our efforts to work more on human rights education in humanitarian settings. So it's uh, first of a series of initiatives we would like to propose you uh, going forward. Uh, so this is uh, not the last one and our exchanges and dialogue on, the, on this topic will continue. So definitely we invite you to stay tuned and uh, uh, we will keep sharing information after this event as well on human rights education and engage with you going forward. If you would like to know more about the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, I would invite you to uh, reach out directly to myself or to Elisa or Isaiah. We will put our emails in the chat. But today, um, we really focus on this very specific topic on challenges and opportunities that human rights education can present in humanitarian settings. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to Elisa Gazzotti and the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, Cochero, who will guide us through today's session. So over to you, Elisa. Thank you so much, Valerie, and welcome to everyone. I really would like to welcome all of you to this webinar and especially the panelists for today. So before we start, I would like to briefly remind you the ground rule for this event. So the webinar will last for one hour and a half and is going to be recorded. When you're not speaking, please keep your microphone mute. And also, please use the chat box to ask questions and interact with us. So this webinar will focus on the role of human rights education as a key tool to enhance the protection of human rights of displaced persons and aims at creating a space for sharing best practices and discussing existing challenges and opportunities for human rights education in humanitarian settings. The webinar is structured as follows. Firstly, we will have an introduction of the human rights education framework. Then we will have a presentation on human rights training programs for humanitarian actors, which will be followed by the presentation of the implementation of the Makani program, which is implemented in Jordan. After this, there will be time for answering to the question, which will be collected from the chat box. Now, without further delay, I would like to invite Mrs. Elena Politi, Human Rights Officer at the Human Rights Education Unit of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Elena will give us an overview of the, of the overall framework of human rights education. Over to you, Elena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa, and thank you actually to the organizers uh, uh, of this event for inviting uh, uh, our office uh, to to be engaged and participate in it. Um, I know that in the audience we have uh, a mix of humanitarian and also um, uh, uh, human rights education practitioners. So I hope uh, those who are already uh, dealing with human rights education will bear with me as I will be addressing uh, uh, issues they already heard about or they already know. Um, so I was asked to introduce uh, human rights education principles and developments at the UN next. And that will be my first uh, point for this session uh, today, this presentation. And uh, um, uh, another area that I will touch upon is the increased prominence uh, of human rights education on the UN agenda with the, the um, um, uh, beginning, the, the, the launch of these two different uh, initiatives, the World Programme for Human Rights Education, as well as the um, uh, adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training. Um, next. 
so as we said, uh, uh, let's start with the uh, uh, human rights education and or in the, this, the one you see on the screen is the current definition of human rights education as contained in uh, internationally agreed uh, um, uh, documents at the United Nations. Um, and we can see that human rights education and training, uh, they, uh, human rights education transfers knowledge and develops skills and attitudes that encourage behavior, promoting and protecting human rights. Now, I, as you see, I've uh, put in uh, bold uh, these uh, keywords because they are very important and maybe we can just reflect a little bit on each of them. First of all, human rights education transfers knowledge. Knowledge about human rights standards, but also mechanism for protection, for human rights protection. Now, uh, when we think of the knowledge, uh, we, it is important that we think not any knowledge, but the knowledge on human rights and human rights mechanisms that is relevant to my audience. Uh, for instance, a human rights education program for teachers would be completely different uh, from a human rights education program for police or for young um, uh, people or for uh, uh, refugees or uh, uh, different audiences. So again, yes, it's about knowledge, but it's about uh, the knowledge that my learners need to know about. The second keyword is uh, skills. Human rights education develops skills. Skills for what? To put in practice those standards and to use those mechanisms that uh, we have highlighted uh, before uh, in their work or in their life. So how do I uh, uh, exercise my rights? Not only I know my rights, but I know how to exercise them. The third keyword is attitudes. Obviously, we uh, human rights ed education needs to tackle attitudes in order to uh, reinforce positive attitudes towards human rights, but also change negative attitudes so that knowledge, skills and attitudes can really encourage behavior to promote and protect human rights. So our objective is actually action. Uh, and either reinforcing action to protect human rights or change uh, uh, behaviors that do not protect human rights with the idea that we empower learners to, um, uh, to take action for human rights. Now, um, next, there is this concept of the empowerment role of human rights education, in particular in humanitarian setting, uh, next, um, Human rights education can empower humanitarian actors to adopt a human rights based approach to their work, protect human rights and encourage duty bearers, which is mainly uh, state actors, to meet their obligation to protect, fulfill and promote human rights. In humanitarian setting, human rights education can also empower uh, right holders, especially those populations in situation of vulnerability, to claim, to claim and realize their rights and engage in relevant decision making processes. And you will see that uh, in the uh, next presentations, we address both of these two uh, areas of human rights education in humanitarian setting, with the first one focusing on humanitarian action, uh, human rights uh, training for humanitarian actors, and the next one on human rights education for uh, population in situation of vulnerability in uh, humanitarian contexts. Uh, next, because human rights education has to do all this, uh, it's really a complex undertaking. And, uh, um, and this is also why the methodology, the way we do it is key. Uh, depending on what we do, uh, we can really make a major contribution and uh, depending on the way we do human rights education, it can really make a huge contribution to the protection of human rights or can be a counterproductive activity that we should not do it uh, actually. So what uh, my point here is that this methodology is really key. And I'm now um, highlighting three points uh, that uh, to me are very important. First of all, uh, the first one is about the training cycle. The actually delivery of a training session or an education session or a course are at the at really moment that okay, come at the end 
of a training cycle uh, or education cycle, which start with the, not the actually training room, whatever is in a virtual, you know, online training or face to face training. It starts not with that moment, but it starts with uh, an initial assessment. First of all, is training, is human rights training, human rights education, what I really need to do in that specific situation? One. Two, how do I address the real learning needs of my audience? And that is what we call training needs assessment. Um, again, re let's remember always that at the center of my training is the audience I need to uh, support in terms of developing knowledge, skills, attitudes toward behavior. Next. Also, it is important that uh, in education and training um, practices, learners are actors and not recipient of education and training. Um, the, the point is that our learners are people with an experience with the um, and who can who have to take ownership of their learning rather than the trainers to put uh, things in, 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 in them as uh, they are empty boxes. Third, uh, an important point is also about evaluation. Um, usually when we do our training of trainers, we ask uh, our participants, when do I do evaluation in education and training? And they tell you uh, often at the end, after the program, to uh, evaluate if people have learned. As a matter of fact, an effective evaluation process in, in training cycle uh, look at evaluation as an ongoing uh, process that starts with the, actually the planning and continues during the design of the program and then goes into the uh, program itself during the program at the end and afterwards. So the evaluation is not what you do at the end of training, but is a continuous program that it goes around uh, together with the training cycle that touches upon again planning, design, delivery and follow up to training. Uh, maybe the good news uh, uh, is that uh, all this is explained in details because we have very few minutes to go into this, but all this uh, methodology is explained in detail in various resources available to you, but in particular um, uh, our manual on human rights training methodology, which is accessible uh, online uh, and is also available in our copies, but uh, uh, is available already in four UN languages and um, uh, which are English, French, Spanish and uh, Arabic. And soon it's uh, going to be published in Russian too. So you are very uh, 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 welcome. Uh, you're very welcome to uh, uh, look into it. And my colleague has put uh, um, uh, the link in the chat. Now, briefly, um, I will look into the next uh, UN initiatives. And so human rights education has really, since the proclamation of the Universal Declaration, as uh, um, uh, the human rights education has a, um, encountered more and more um, uh, consensus in the international community as an important uh, undertaking. There have been many initiatives being uh, um, undertaken in the UN system, and uh, uh, we have developed recently an infographic uh, with uh, uh, highlighted some of those initiatives, which uh, uh, um, the link to it will be put in the chat also. And also there have been human rights education provisions being uh, including in many international treaties and other documents. And we have a full material called the right to human rights education, uh, which is also accessible to you. And you will have the link in the chat also coming soon. Now, uh, I just focus briefly on uh, uh, two recent one. One is this World Programme for Human Rights Education, which is a common collective framework for national action by all countries. Next. It is based on uh, human rights standards agreed by member states uh, in, uh, at the international level and is organized in five uh, year consecutive phases. Next, you will see the five phases, the, the five years phases here, uh, which have uh, um, uh, developed from the first phase 
to the current fourth phase, which covers human rights education for youth. Next. For each phase, there is a plan of action that provides methodological guidance and set specific responsibilities for different actors. And you will see that uh, um, for the current phase, uh, the plan of action really focuses on uh, expanding human rights education for, with, and by youth in formal and informal education and uh, informal learning, prioritizing young people in situation of exclusion and vulnerability, uh, including uh, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs, and returnees. So I said the World Program is one particular initiative. The second one is the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, which was adopted in 2011 and is uh, uh, the first UN document entirely devoted to human rights education in the context of the UN. Um, of course, there have been others, as I mentioned, and there is an entire resource material, the right to human rights education, where you can look at all these different uh, um, documents. It's, uh, uh, it's important because it reaffirms the responsibility of governments, particularly to promote and ensure human rights education. And you, we have, you have a quote here that again takes you to the concept of empowerment, the role of empowering, the empowering role of human rights education, which we have focused on earlier. And uh, next, what is inter interesting about these two initiatives is that they are really complementary. While the World Programme is really an operational framework to advance national implementation and force the cooperation at all levels. The UN declaration rather uh, provide uh, a policy statement expressing uh, UN member states commitment to human rights education and training. Next. Now I've only gone on the surface of all this. You have uh, more information and resources available, uh, particularly uh, uh, on OSCHR website uh, devoted to human rights education and uh, the section on human rights education, and you can see here how to reach it. You can reach us uh, anytime by through this email that you also see there, which is WPHRE, World Program Human Rights Education, at OHCHR.org. Thank you very much. I'm at your disposal for any questions or clarification. Thank you so much, Elena, for this very comprehensive presentation on human rights education framework. So, as Elena mentioned, human rights education can empower humanitarian actors to use a human rights-based approach to their work, protect human rights, and encourage duty bearers to meet their obligation. So, in this view, I would like now to introduce you Elsa Lapenek, human rights advisor to the regional humanitarian coordinator for the Syrian crisis, which will give us an overview on training programs for humanitarian actors on human rights standards, mechanisms, and engagement challenges, opportunity, and the way forward. Over to you, Elsa. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa, and thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Just wanted to, yeah? Okay, yes. Great. So thank you very much to you and, and Valerie and to the Global Protection Cluster for um, organizing this um, this important webinar. Um, it's it's a pleasure to speak in 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 this uh, in in this group and to join this group about the experience of uh, the human rights advisors in this Syria response. So I'm um, indeed Elsa. I'm uh, one of the three human rights advisors uh, deployed by uh, OHCHR by the Human Rights Office. In the Syria response, uh, I've been working with the office for a few years. First, in Gaziantep as the human rights advisor to the deputy humanitarian regional direct, um, coordinator, and um, and then um, in Amman since November as the human rights advisor to the regional uh, HC. So I'll try to be brief after my my colleague Elena, uh, and I will focus on on three points. One to first explain the the structure. Um, um, of the, the Syria uh, human rights team and the coordination with humanitarian uh, coordinators and partners. And then to um, dive in, maybe next slide, please. Yeah, to dive in um, the work we're doing to build the capacity of humanitarian actors on uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law norms and standards. Uh, and then discuss very briefly the, the the challenges that we've seen over the years and, and the opportunities that we have based on, on this experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, so 
I will uh, start just by giving you a very few words of background and, and to explain the context in which the human rights advisors are working uh, with humanitarian actors in the Syria response. Uh, you may have heard about this whole of Syria approach, which is based on uh, a Security Council resolution adopted in 2014, which is um, uh, which has established this this approach, uh, authorizing the humanitarian leadership and the provision of uh, humanitarian assistance from three hubs, Damascus, Amman, and Gaziantep, uh, and then, of course, authorizing the cross-border humanitarian operation from Turkey. Um, just to say here that uh, what we did as an office at that time, what OHCHR um, did was to opt to support the humanitarian actors' integration of IHL and human rights in this whole of Syria humanitarian operation. Uh, and indeed, this deployment uh, led to uh, having this three human rights advisors uh, in the three hubs, not only supporting humanitarian uh, coordinators, but also very much working very closely with humanitarian actors through the sectors, through the clusters, uh, to uh, integrate human rights, uh, to build the capacity of humanitarian actors uh, on IHL and human rights, um, and to uh, engage on, on the, the humanitarian um, program cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just give you two examples, and, and, and I will really focus on, on two um, main tasks and, and responsibility that we had uh, over the last four years. One is really the example of the engagement with the health cluster and the protection cluster uh, and the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. Um, very briefly, the idea, of course, with the situation in Syria where we had a number of attacks on health facilities uh, since at least 2015, but, but mainly 2016, um, prompted the protection cluster and the health cluster to develop what we call the advocacy notes on uh, the right to health, but uh, mainly on attacks on on healthcare. And um, what we decided with the humanitarian coordinator in Gaziantep was really to try to improve and to strengthen the IHL and the human rights uh, language uh, for advocacy uh, in this in this advocacy note. So that was really the starting point of this engagement uh, with the two clusters. Um, so we provided this technical guidance uh, based on this, we started engaging with the special rapporteur um, at that time, Dr. Puras. Um, in 2016, we worked with WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, the health cluster, and of course the protection uh, cluster. We did a round table. And this was really the initial point of an engagement that we then did with um, the food security and livelihood sector, the shelter and NFI and education uh, cluster to see how we could support those members of those of those sectors with um, a better knowledge uh, and understanding of the IHL and human rights framework to help them not only in terms of data collection, uh, monitoring, reporting, analysis, and of course advocacy uh, uh, to, to improve their own uh, response. Um, so that really led, uh, as of 2016, um, to a series of um, human rights training that we did not only on IHL and human rights, but also on media messaging, on human rights advocacy, and really uh, on uh, engagement with the, the UN special procedures. And that's really where we uh, have been working very closely with the clusters since 2018 uh, on the first occasion where um, the objective for us um, and the clusters was to focus on the structure and the coverage of the UN human rights mechanisms, but also to really build the participants' capacity to use the mechanisms in relation to the to the Syria crisis. Um, so we started, of course, by facilitating contacts between humanitarian actors um, engaged in the Syria uh, response and the mandate holders of the me mechanisms, or also with our colleagues, which are Geneva staff, supporting the different mandates and committees. 
Um, this was particularly effective, as I mentioned, in relation to the right to health uh, and right to food, uh, as a matter of fact, with um, activities organized with those two uh, respective special rapporteurs, um, including public statements and engagement that we had uh, on, on those two, two rights. Um, the idea now is to repeat this um, and this to, to become sort of a, a regular um, support provided by human rights advice and by the office to um, actually five clusters, uh, of course, to continue to raise awareness and knowledge uh, of humanitarians uh, on the different type of work um, and uh, response that uh, a special rapporteur or uh, also on the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, uh, but also to really increase the engagement. Uh, and that's uh, why it, it's really good to see this uh, uh, task team uh, set up within the Global Protection Cluster to support the, the national level and the, the clusters uh, in the, the field uh, uh, clusters on that to use this mechanism to enhance their effectiveness in the in the humanitarian um in the humanitarian uh, response and that's again very much on data collection and analysis and advocacy and what of course we aim in sort of a longer term is to sort of trigger a longer term engagement by humanitarian partners um on uh, economic and social rights uh integrating a gender and intersectional perspective and really to look at how with the support of the human rights office in the field um, through our field presences through uh, our participation in, in clusters uh, how we can uh, formulate recommendation how we can inform policies and programs and and sort of develop a more inclusive prevention and response measures uh, to comprehensively address uh, economic and social rights um next slide please and that will be my my, my last slide when it comes to the challenges and opportunities, and I'll be brief on that one, um, one of the um, challenges that really um, uh, that we see uh, across the, the, the field uh, presences uh, is really the, the, the language packaging. Um, we are trying our best when it comes to this human rights uh, training and capacity building efforts in the field to sort of demystify the human rights-based approach. Uh, one of the important aspects of the work that human rights advisors are doing and other 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 field presence is really to support and inform an effective human rights advocacy in the humanitarian response. Um, so we need to be specific to humanitarian context and 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 really try to resonate with partners um, and, and include uh, uh, um, formulation of protection outcomes uh, um, uh, that really speaks to uh, humanitarians uh, and that's one thing that really uh, makes us believe that there the engagement with hum the, the human rights mechanisms can be a very powerful tool for promoting domestic change if it's done strategically uh, and that's very much based on the discussion we have in this uh, regular discussion and engagement with the clusters um, and it needs to be on the right issue on the, at the right time and in the right way. I just want if I have just one last word um, to add on the opportunity. I think that the call to action for human rights, uh, this um, SG uh, initiative and, and the vision for human rights is really a good opportunity for us uh, at the field level to engage uh, across the UN system and to really work for the, the office to work with humanitarians and, and, and the UN agencies and the rest of the UN system to really try to um, come with this human rights centered protection engagement. Uh, whether it takes the form of this capacity building work uh, or or just engagement to to ensure uh, a strong human rights advocacy, but again to be very strategic in this way. So I'll stop here, I guess. Uh, sorry if it was a bit long, and I thank you very much. And and again, you have my contacts at the end of this presentation. Maybe next, last slide. Yes. Thank you very much. Over to you, Elisa.
Thank you very much, Elsa. That was perfect. Um, I would like to remind that if you have any questions, feel free to really post in the chat box so that at the end uh, also Elsa can uh, answer to any question you may have. Now, as we heard from Elena, human rights education is also crucial to empower rights holders to claim and realize their rights. So in this view, I would like to introduce you with um, Kenan Madi, Program Specialist at UNICEF Jordan, and Mega Devonald from the Department of Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence of the Overseas Development Institute. So Kenan will give an overview of the Makani program in Jordan from an implementation perspective, while Megan will focus more on the findings of, of the research study about these programs. Over to you, Kenan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alisa and everyone. Uh, thank you for having the time actually today to have this great webinar. I will leave, uh, if we can present the presentation uh, on the screen maybe, and I will leave it first to Megan to start with, uh, to take you through what we will talk about, and then I will get uh, into the experience about the Nakani. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Keenan. Um, so yes, today um, we're just going to be talking about um, some of the opportunities and challenges um, within human rights education um, in humanitarian settings. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so Keenan's first going to do an overview of the Makani program. Um, I will then go into um, a study that we have done um, of the Makani program um, and looking at how well human rights education has been embedded um within the program um i'll then pass back to keenan um to discuss some of the implementation challenges and then um, i'll conclude with some key conclusions and policy recommendations thank you next slide thank you very much so uh, i will not go into the context in jordan because i think all of you are familiar or somehow familiar about the situation in Jordan, I would go straight to explain what is the Makani program just briefly. Uh, so basically the Makani program is, is, a, is a network of community centers where we implement all what UNICEF does. So meaning we start to uh, target children when, when they are under five. So we have two kinds of program from zero to three, focusing on the mother, we call it the mother and child or the caregiver and child where they give on the ACD and give them give the children or the mother how, some of the skills how to deal with their newborn then we go a step further when the, the children are uh, four to five and again we target them with their care, caregiver to uh, prepare them to, to school and this is the program where we call the learning uh, readiness then we go into two main area, which is the education part we call it the learning support services which is uh, informal education and then uh, uh, complemented with psychosocial support of course then when the children gets to their 13 years old they will be uh, eligible or able to go to the skills building program which has three different uh, components under it which is digital skills financial literacy and life skills going uh, and now we started actually to provide more advanced digital skills all certified as well and then we've targeted also the parents of those children with the, the better uh, parenting uh, program so this is what the, the mccani is if if we look at the slide if i want to put in the middle like you see the logo of mccani but also we can put here the core of the program and i will explain about that later is about uh, human rights, it's the child protection principle. So this is where the whole program is based regardless of what the children are getting. And, and we'll, I will come to this uh, later. Maybe we go next, please. So the, the Makani has different competitive advantage. So it's a cross-sectoral program. So we provide different type of services inside the same center under one roof so the children can get to the center and get the services based on what they need uh, it has a very good coverage in terms of focusing on the most vulnerable areas and a group uh, in, in jordan with a strong community presence and that's the, the community presence and the, the relation is based on relying on a very deep rooted national partner who has been uh, who have been working in jordan for the long time uh, we have a good data system, which uh, we, we have all the data which, which help us for monitoring purposes. 
Uh, we have a good uh, evidence about the impact of the program. One of those evidence is what we, what, what Megan will uh, talk about today. Uh, the program is flexible and that helped us uh, through COVID, for example. So when the COVID pandemic emerged, we were able to adapt very quickly. Uh, we have, as I said before, strong capacity, a strong national partner with a huge capacity, and we have high ownership of the implementing partner and the government represented it by the Ministry of Social Development. Next, please. So the program has developed where in 2015, and of course, like all the organization in their response to the Syria crisis in, in, in Jordan and the, the refugee uh, crisis here, but then it started to develop uh, differently. So in 2016, and it started to adapt to the context as well. So in 2016, for example, the majority of the, the, the beneficiary were Syrian refugee, and they were out of school actually Syrian refugee. While if you look in 2017, that changed where we started to be more 50-50 between the host community, Jordanian and the Syrian, uh, basically, and we started due to the change in Jordan, to the acceptance of Syrian children in public schools. So that also reduced the number of out of school children because many of those who were out of school referred to school and they became more, uh, more, more enrolled in, 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 in the public system. Uh, in 2018, also here where we started to do more rationalization, we started also to go to more direct implementation, focus more on the issue related to sustainability, uh, the partner we, we, we are dealing uh, with, and we started to give a big focus on specifically in our centers and, and refugee camps on the principles related to human rights or the child protection. So there was a huge uh, scale up of the capacity building of the frontline staff specifically in the camps. I mean, in host community, it started earlier, but in the camps, it took us more time for the front line to be able to digest th those principles. And I will come to that later also on the challenges part. Uh, in, in two, between 2018 and 2019, we were able to merge everything we do with the human rights principle or the child protection principle. So any child who gets to this center, they will be able to be exposed to the main human rights or the child protection messages, focusing on their rights, focusing on the acceptance, the, the violence, for uh, not accepting the violence, the bullying, accepting others. So all of those principles started to be embedded in anything. So if a child is getting an Arabic classes, those principles were embedded in the Arabic classes. The same if they are on the skills building component, for example. So it started to be the core of everything we does. In 2020, of course, like uh, all the program around the world, we were busy responding to, to, um, to the COVID pandemic and, and we continue again to focus more on the psychosocial support and we continue to focus on the uh, child protection approach or the human rights approach as well. So this is how the program uh, developed. I will leave it to, to Megan, uh, over to you Megan for the next, over. Thanks Keenan. Um, so first I'll do a quick overview um, of the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Programme. Um, so this is a longitudinal research program um, that's run over nine years in seven different low income countries. Um, so we work um, in Africa, in Ethiopia and Rwanda, um, in Asia, Bangladesh and Nepal, and um, in the Middle East, Palestine, Jordan um, and Lebanon. Um, so we're aiming to find out what works um, to support the development and empowerment of adolescent boys and girls, um, both now and in the future. Um, so in some of these countries, we're partnered um, with different programmes. So in Jordan, um, we're partnered with UNICEF Jordan, and we have been involved in um, evaluating um, the Makani programme. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the research that I'm going to speak about today, um, it stems from an article um, that was recently published in the Human Rights Education Review. Um, so this is looking at the extent to which uh, human rights education is embedded in two different um, non-formal programmes, one in Jordan and one in Bangladesh. 
Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the findings um, from Jordan. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so I'll quickly go over um, our methodology um, for this research. So um, we had a total of 1,593 Syrian uh, refugee adolescents um, across a range of research sites um, in both host communities and camps, informal tents and settlements. Um, and this was across Amman, uh, Mafric and Erevind. Um, so the quantitative um, data we focus just um, on adolescents aged 10 to 14. Um, and in the qualitative, we focused on adolescents aged 10 to 14, um, but also some older adolescents aged 15 um, to 18. Um, so we've used a range of participatory research methods. Um, for example, we um, had focus group discussions with um, Makani participants where they were asked to um, rank various aspects of the program in terms of what had the most impact on them. Um, we also had interviews with parents um, and key informants, such as Makali facilitators. Um, we also ensured that um, our sample um, included a subset of adolescents who are the most vulnerable, so um, such as adolescents with disabilities and um, married adolescents. Next slide, please. Next slide again. Um, so I will talk about our findings um, based on um, the human rights um, framework, looking at human rights um, about, through and for. Um, so starting at um, the human uh, rights about, so looking more at um, the content of the programme. Um, we found that the Makani programme was really centred on a child's rights approach um, and includes really substantial content on uh, different aspects of human rights. Um, such as child protection, uh, freedom from violence, um, conflict resolution. Um, so adolescents were taught the differences between um, psychological, sexual and physical violence um, and the importance of um, reporting this um, to a trusted adult. Um, so this was reflected in the quantitative data. Um, as you can see, uh, Makani attendees were more likely to know where to um, seek support if they experience violence um, compared to those that did not attend. Um, there's also quite a lot of focus on um, child marriage. Um, so adolescents were participating in different role plays um, that focus on the risks of early marriage. Um, as Keenan kind of mentioned, um, where possible human rights um, education is kind of embedded across the programme um, rather than just taught in a um, standalone uh, life skills um, course. Next slide, please. So next, um, looking through human rights, um, so looking at whether the teaching methodologies um, are aligned with um, human rights values and principles. Um, so we found that the Makani program um, had a very participatory approach um, with teachers using um, more open dialogue and um, discussion which was quite a stark contrast to the more um, authoritarian style um, that you see in formal schooling, um, where there's often quite a lot of emphasis on corporate punishment. Um, so this was something that the adolescents in our sample really valued um, and they enjoyed the kind of chance to have more open discussions and participate more um, during sessions at Makani. Um, the programme also encouraged social cohesion um, between different uh, nationalities of host and refugee students um, and again this is something that um, participants um, highlight as a key benefit of the program. Um, other participants highlighted that they learnt about um, inclusion um, through interacting with um, adolescents with disabilities. Uh, next slide please. So finally um, on for human rights, so this is um, looking at um, whether individuals are ultimately empowered to be able to exercise their um, human rights um, and respect the rights of others. Um, so we found um, less examples of this um, in our findings, um, but um, we found that some adolescents that particularly were participating in the social innovation labs um, 
where they were taught to apply their learning to different problems that they wanted to tackle in the community. Um, had learned kind of wider skills such as um, the importance of volunteering and leadership skills. Um, additionally, we found that Makani participants um, were more comfortable expressing opinions to older people um, compared to those who didn't participate. Um, so although these are not directly linked to human rights, they are kind of building the skills that adolescents um, need to be able to um, exercise their human rights um, in the community and respect rights of others. Um, so we also found examples of adolescents um, who, after participating in Makani, um, were um, kind of demanding their rights, um, refusing child marriage or trying to assist that they stay in education. Um, they were also kind of passing their knowledge on to their parents and to their peers around them as well. Um, next slide. So I'll pass back to Keenan now, who is going to talk um, about some of the challenges um, in Kani. Thanks. Next, please. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much. So basically, some of the challenges we have faced on the ground and the implementation of the program was, for example, to introduce those concepts to uh, to the frontline staff and specifically in the refugee camps. So in the refugee camps, we were relying uh, all of our frontline are from the refugee themselves living in the camps as well. So it was a bit challenging at the beginning to introduce those new concepts for them. We're talking about child labor, early marriage, for example, the, the rights approach. All of those were new to many of the facilitators, specifically that many of them, they didn't have such a back background or they were not exposed to such uh, ideas before. And that's why we had in 2018 to, to invest a lot in the capacity building of those uh, facilitator and to the, to a larger extent we were successful in building their capacity and knowledge i mean in, th in that terms the capacity was about convincing them about the importance of those rights or what are those rights and how they are important and reflect should be reflected on the children life as well and and their own life as well as a as a facilitators and, and living in, in, in the camp settings uh, Basically, and, and the second point, actually, it uh, I mean, it's funny, Alisa and I, we were in a, for, in a, in a McCanny Center just two weeks ago. And after we spoke with the children and interview and had some nice chat with them, they were telling us about their knowledge, how they know their rights, and they know everything about that. And so we saw their knowledge and we touched the, the knowledge they, they have. But while we were leaving, we had a Syrian woman, a refugee, coming to us, speaking, knocking on our car and asking for food, saying she doesn't have any more money to feed her children. And actually her children were inside the center in that class where Elisa and I, we were interacting with those children. And then, and this is what we face, all of us and all of you were, were either working in the field now or the, have been in the uh, the field at a certain point and what we teach and the capacity we are raising and then the, and for the awareness we are raising about the human rights approach not necessarily match with the reality in the ground meaning we talk about the rights for education for example but now with covid and the, the school closure and in, in jordan and many other countries and around the world many of the children were left behind actually. They didn't have access to online platform. They didn't have access uh, to internet. So then this is, there's a gap between what are those, what the rights are and what, uh, what reality is. However, I mean, it's good to tell them what they should have, but also reality is still very tough for them. How to mitigate this from our side, we link this program to other program which provide cash for example but it's never enough i mean uh, whether unicef or, or all the other un agencies or NG ngos are doing it's not enough to to help this uh, huge number of refugees in jordan and uh, the syria and the countries around syria in general uh, 
Uh, third point, there was some pushback from uh, parents and caregivers, for example. So we had incidents where actually a father will come to the center to tell us how come you are teaching our daughters such a concept about early marriage. So they thought that we are teaching them bad things which could reflect on, 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 on them badly as a family. However, how to mitigate this as well? We, in our program, we started to focus on the parents as well. So that's why we have a big components focusing on the better parenting and introducing those concepts to the parents as well, not only the children. Uh, it was hard to maintain this approach uh, during COVID because everything shifted to remote support. We mitigated by continue mainstreaming those messages whenever we can, but still it was challenging. And uh, I mean, a big question, how those awareness raising uh, and how those concepts will influence the life of those children on the long term. And this is why, of course, we have this cooperation with Gage over nine years to know how this could be translated on the long term. And that will help us to understand the impact on the long, der long term better. Uh, over to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll quickly go th through the conclusions um, and recommendations. Um, so I think what we found is the McCarney program provides uh, quite a good example of promising practices uh, within human rights education. Um, and draws attention to the inherent value of including human rights education within the humanitarian response, um, particularly within fostering social cohesion um, and directly challenging some of the more culturally sensitive topics such as child marriage and gender-based violence. Um, when we compare this to other programmes that we've, we've looked at, um, often that's the area that it's lacking in terms of um, challenging those kind of more culturally sensitive um, topics. Um, so finally, just a few recommendations, um, just to ensure that programmes are properly resourced, um, particularly with regards to facilitator training, um, integrating human rights education in the programme design stage, promoting social cohesion through um, having mixed nationality um, groups and ensuring a safe um, environment um, with really strong reporting mechanisms. Thanks. And then just the final slide, if you want to find out more about um, the research that we've done, the article um, that this has been based on is um, available on our website and on the Human Rights Education Review website as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kenan and Megan, for this presentation and also for really bringing the reality uh, to us. So I have now some questions uh, that we received, and um, I can start maybe with uh, Megan and Kenan. Since um, so, a couple of questions. One is, um, what are your lessons learned, learned if there is a similar program being set up in other operations? And you already partially respond to this, but maybe if you can, yeah, give us more details. And the second question also for you is, uh, how do you measure impact of the Makani project? Thank you very much. Over to you, Kenan and uh, Megan. So I will start with the last question on the impact. Of course, we have our own impact evaluation as, a, as UNICEF. So each component has its own, its own impact evaluation. We do the evaluation, which we do, for instance, now we just started a summative evaluation, which will focus on three years of the implementation. And in addition to that, we are partner, partnering with organizations like ODI to do an, a third party evaluation, which we are not even, uh, we are part of it, of course, for the coordination, for, the, for all of that. But we see the findings like anyone else when, when they do it. Uh, for example, what Megan has explained, I have seen it after it was published. So it, it's, I mean, to be clear, it's nothing that we can uh, influence. So we have the three layers of uh, evaluation, as I said. First, what we do regularly based on our, each component, pre and post, the monitoring we do. And then second, the evaluation, which we'll, we do every two or three years, depends on the size of the program. And third, and partnering with such uh, uh, like world-class organization like ODI and, and the GAGE uh, initiative. So I, I missed your first question, Alisa. Was it about if we want to implement the program in other countries? 
Yeah, in a way, what are the recommendations if there is a similar program that can be set up in other uh, operations? I think I just want to say, and I will leave to make it because she touched base on the recommendation as well. I just want to say it's very easy to once you have the buy in from the frontline staff, it's become very easy because they are the one who are inter interacting with the children and their par parents on a daily basis. And they are the one who most likely are from the same community as well. So it's very easy for them to influence that. So you just need, and it will take time. It will take time for them to buy it because some of them, they will have personally something against an early match, for example. And this is what we face in the camp. But then this is one, two, to put in a place a very good monitoring system and structure to monitor this knowledge and to to make sure whenever there is a monitoring visit, whenever there is an interaction with those frontline staff that we are asking if those messages are being implemented or not, and include it in any evaluation we do across the three pillars, as I said, like the own organization evaluation uh, on day-to-day -day basis, the evaluation which we, any organization does every three years, or and, and anything we do. So I think it's easier than... It, looks once you have the buy-in of the frontline staff and this is where you have to start from the beginning to focus on those concepts in my opinion megan over to you if you have any question i'm happy to answer more and i hope that i answered the question if not please ask me again and i will expand over thanks keenan um yeah just to build on um some of the points that keenan has um mentioned so i think um Having really strong facilitator training is uh, quite key. When we've looked at um, the program in Bangladesh, um, that was one of the things that was quite um, lacking within um, within that program um, that Makani really did have. Um, similarly, having these really strong um, reporting mechanisms um, and working really closely with the community um, to kind of tackle some of these more um, entrenched social norms, um, especially regarding um, child marriage and child labour and things like that. Um, yes, I think Keenan kind of covered quite a lot of um, the points for that, so I think that's that's all from me. And okay. Alyssa, sorry, just to go back, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I just want to say also part of the evaluation we are doing is a lot focusing on controlled group. So we just finalized, for example, an evaluation about uh, the informal tented settlement and how the, who are served by uh, UNICEF or other agencies, compare them to those who were left behind, actually, because of funding purposes, nothing else. But you can see the difference when you do the controlled group. And I really recommend for such, a, and this is what the gauge did as well. I mean, focusing on, on controlled groups or comparing two groups, together because that's give us more uh, better understanding and on, on the impact over from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, now I will um, I have a question for Elsa. So the first question is the, in regard to the work done by the OHCPRs, what advocacy has been possible or open by the office with states? And second, also, what would that be happening in the UN forums, mainly or directly with states? So that's the first question for you. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Elisa, and uh, thanks for the question. So, well, very briefly, what um, I can flag, um, first of all, the special rapporteur or human rights mechanism, a special rapporteur, um, and for all of you to know, we have um, 44 thematics special rapporteurs and, 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 and 11 country mandates um, as of today, I think. Um, you can do a number of things. One is, of course, to, to engage with uh, all stakeholders, um, um, NGOs, UN uh, agencies, um, um, and, and states to gather information on, on the realization of each right. So if we talk about what we've done with the, the Special Rapporteur on the right to health, 
so we've started doing this very much like uh, the idea was to to collect all the information about the re the, the right to health in in Syria. Um, we have issued at least two statements in 2016 and 2017, and I can send you the link right now or just after I respond to the question. Um, those statements are a way to not only address a number of violations, but also remind the IHL and, and human rights framework. And you will see in the statement there was one 2016 about attacks on healthcare, uh, and, and another one with the special rapporteur on the right to food uh, on. Um, besieged areas and the violation of the right to health and the right to food, uh, including in Eastern Ghouta, which is a besieged area. So that's one thing. Then there is also the possibility to, to engage in a dialogue uh, with the government. And that's also something that is being done um, through what we call communications. Uh, um, and then, and and then finally, one of the other uh, avenues, of course, the reports that uh, a special procedure uh, will uh, present to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly on a regular basis. Um, so, so that's one thing. Just to mention, um, there is a tendency of indeed um, prioritizing this first communication with the government and then a statement uh, to address the violation and to suggest uh, sort of public advocacy, but that's uh, very much uh, based on uh, um, a communication with the, with, the, with the government. What we're doing now, and that's really based on the previous engagement with the previous special rapporteur, is that we are re-engaging with the new special rapporteur on the right to health, who is a, a medical doctor from South Africa. Uh, she's specialized in sexual reproductive health and rights, and she has expressed interest in engaging and re-engaging with us. So we are working with uh, UNFPA and the GBV subcluster, uh, as well as uh, uh, with um, um, uh, colleagues uh, like Physicians for Human Rights and, and, and Syrian NGOs to, to re-engage with the um, on, on this issue. On the second question, so as I say, I mean, there is indeed this, this public advocacy through statement, uh, but we also did um, um, a, f a round table. We organized a round table in Gaziantep a few years ago with the special rapporteur uh, who came to Gaziantep uh, to join um, a roundtable co-organized by us and the health cluster uh, and WHO uh, as well as with other other um, uh, stakeholders and and colleagues uh, on SRHR on attacks on healthcare and on mental health and that's something that we are readdressing and we are doing again soon uh, as well as we are exploring other avenues. So again, just to conclude, there are very a variety a variety of of uh, of um, actions and intervention that a special procedure can take and very much based on the context and a context analysis, of course. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Elsa. I have another question that I will ask also to Elena. So um, what, uh, like from the UN agency, how this is working in the context of the UN delivering as one? Yeah. Okay, um, but first of all, just to give you an example, um, uh, this uh, current phase of the World Program for Human Rights Education, which is focusing on human rights education for youth, uh, um, is being, uh, um, let's say, uh, on our side, on the UN side, um, uh, designed in, and implemented, at least from what we can contribute as a UN, very closely between the Office of the High Commissioner, UNESCO, and the UN uh, Youth Envoy of the Secretary General. You may know that the Secretary General has uh, um, uh, developed and launched in 2018 a youth strategy, and therefore we are really uh, bringing together uh, um, main partners within the system uh, in order to implement together this program um, that is uh, uh, focusing on a common uh, uh, priority audience. So this is just to say that uh, uh, it is uh, actually, um, uh, uh, at least the, the work we are doing now, focusing on human rights education for youth, it is a UN-wide priority and implemented with other entities jointly of the UN system. 
Uh, I wanted also to uh, respond to another uh, issue that was raised, which is the issue of good practices. What good practices are available for you colleagues working also in the field um, on other practices in other places that can be replicated or can be of inspiration? Uh, actually, this is an area where uh, we realize that uh, really uh, documenting and sharing good practices can really inspire good action. Uh, in uh, from one place to another or from one uh, audience to another. And therefore, we have been really focusing on building, um, uh, documenting good practices as well as uh, compiling them and uh, organize meetings also in that context to, to, to bring together good practices. Just to give you some examples and some ideas and materials that you are available to you, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a few years ago, it was in the context of the uh, um, fifth anniversary of the um, uh, uh, UN Declaration uh, on Human Rights Education and Training. Uh, we organized, uh, we developed together with other partners, including Sogakaka International, who is here with uh, Elisa representing, uh, a movie to document stories of uh, human rights education programs that have made an impact on, on the life of people. And, uh, and we produce a, um, a movie that is available on the uh, um, uh, human rights education and training section of our uh, uh, website uh, that uh, you will have a link soon uh, um, uh, on the chat. Um, a movie on stories, for instance, on human rights education programs for school children. This was a program in, in India or human rights education uh, programs for uh, uh, women's victim of violence in Tur Turkey or human rights training programs for uh, police in Australia and uh, uh, explaining how these programs have really made an impact and change uh, uh, lives uh, both of individuals but also of their communities. And this is a movie that is available, for instance, and you can use also for educational programs in your uh, um, settings. Uh, we have co published compendium of good practices, for instance, in the school systems, and uh, those are also available on our uh, um, uh, uh, website. But uh, um, interestingly, we have been for many, many years now compiling materials uh, that have been used in different countries and we have now a resource collection of more than 400 uh, materials that are uh, that you can search online through our library catalog and again that is available in um, uh, uh, the entry uh, to that catalog is available in our human rights education and training webpage. Another thing that we've been doing is, as I mentioned, organizing meetings of uh, practitioners to share good practices. Just to mention some of them very recent. In 2017, we had the, the um, uh, International Conference on Human Rights Education in Montreal, uh, which is documented. Also, uh, you can uh, um, find the information through our website. And we are now publishing a companion of good practices uh, that have been uh, um, presented at the conference. In 2019, we organized an all youth session on human rights education for youth uh, in the context of the Human Rights Council Social Forum. And that is also uh, that brought uh, young people to tell about their practices of human rights education. And that's also the report of that meeting is available on our website. And just to invite you to be uh, to continue to stay engaged on this issue uh, in September we are organizing uh, um, a, a high level uh, panel at the UN Human Rights Council September 2021 on uh, good practices on human rights education for by and with youth uh, and uh, that will be uh, webcasted so you will be uh, if you are interested uh, you can um, attend uh, online you know or by webcast you can attend the the panel and uh, also learn about uh, uh, good practices at different levels governmental national human rights institutions civil society practices particularly focusing on human rights education for youth so stay tuned and uh, uh, check regularly our web page where we post information about these materials thank you thank you very much elena thank you um, we, do receive, we did receive another question 
for um, ELSA. So, in some contexts like Syria, the protection sector struggles with being able to conceptualize the critical connection between human rights and the sector's work. So, Elsa, can you please share some challenge in demystifying human rights to protection actors and also sharing a successful approach that may have led the, the protection actors acknowledging and the obvious and working better with human rights um, approach or incorporating human rights frameworks in your work. Thank you. Thanks, Elisa, for the question. Can you repeat the beginning of the question? I, I think I missed that. I couldn't hear well. Yes, sorry. In some contexts like Syria, the protection sector struggles with being able to conceptualize the critical connection between human rights and the sector's work. So, I mean, the, as protection actors, uh, very often uh, there is the, um, yeah, it's very difficult to, to show this connection with human rights and uh, um, the, like the protection work start from a framework of human rights violation as causative factors and conceptualize our protection work within that. Yeah, um, indeed, I mean, it's, um, th that's why I actually started by saying that the, the, important of, uh, the importance of the, the work of HRAs was really at the beginning to, to spend time with each clusters and, and beyond the protection cluster, I would say. Uh, and that's that's part of the the centrality of uh, centrality of protection, right? To to ensure that this IHL and human rights framework was largely discussed uh, in each of the sector and in each of of these rights, with the with the participation of the protection sector as part of the protection mainstreaming, right? Um, and and I think that this is the first stage and the first step towards. Um, um, a human rights um, training to ensure that not only there is an awareness uh, on the on on the rights and on the framework on the legal framework as well as on the options uh, to uh, address the the needs for for you know stronger monitoring stronger analysis and strong, stronger advocacy. So th there's a number of issues, but but what I can say, I mean, I, I, what I can say is that what we did was really to work with the protection sector and other sectors, also with OCHA to identify those areas where stronger and further analysis was needed, and that's why the the, the what we call the 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 package that the uh, OACHR Syria team is working not only with the monitoring team and the legal advisor allowed us to actually respond to those needs in terms of analysis. So we came up with those legal notes. Um, and again, there was a note, of course, on attacks on, on medical units under IHL that actually led to this um, a protection outcome and 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 and, and advocacy and, and other and many other notes. So I don't have any specific example, but what I what is important here is really to to look at the way we've managed based on this first and and, and initial understanding of what protection is and, and how human rights protection uh, is part of the overall definition of protection, uh, how that led to a better uh, collaboration between us as human rights actors and the protection uh, uh, actors. Uh, so I don't know if you, I responded to the question uh, very well, but I'm very happy to have a bilateral discussion. But again, I can unpack uh, with other examples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsa. Um, I don't know if Valerie, you want to add something or? No, I think it's very interesting. Yes, and we are coming to the end. Thank you. OK, that's great. Thank you. So sorry, I mute myself. So we received the, another question. Uh, is the, if there is any plan to organize a webinar focusing on South Asia. So as Valerie said, this was really the first webinar. So of course, um, any suggestion is welcome. And I would invite the person that uh, dropped this question in the chat box to contact uh, me, Isaiah and Valerie, so to further take this. Um, I don't know if there is any more question from the participants. Uh, we still have about uh, yeah, 10 minutes. And if not, maybe then I will pass the last word to the speakers for the final word. Thank you. Thank you.
maybe I see someone. No, maybe uh, Megan and Kenan. Would you like to say like a concluding final word to the participants? Uh, of course, I mean, th first, let me thank you all for taking the time to attend. And uh, again, I think from our experience on the ground, this is something which paying off for us. So we started with this concept a couple of years ago, and now we can see the change happen. So as I said, whenever we do any evaluation or we look more into details, it is this. And you have seen Alisa maybe in the, on the ground as well when we visited the center. Those concepts are being embedded now in this new generation, which is a so vulnerable and unfortunate generation, at least the one we are targeting. And I think, again, it's, it's easy to implement. I just, I mean, recommend to have it from the beginning, as Megan said, from at the beginning of the program design, and have it. And I believe it should be in any program which any agencies uh, implement. So. When I leave Jordan and when, when, once I leave the, this program to my next duty station, I will carry those ideas with me. And I think it's, it's always successful and, and will have a huge impact on, on those vulnerable children. And thank you again. Megan, over to you. Thanks, Keenan. Um, and yes, thanks for the opportunity to um, present here. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, so I think just summing up, I think what we've shown is um, that human rights education is really a kind of integral part um, or should be seen as an integral part and a core pillar within the humanitarian um, response. So I think um, often there's more focus on just access to kind of more formal education, but um, I think what we've shown here is really the importance of these wiser life skills um, particularly for um, vulnerable refugees, where they've often had um, kind of experiences of rights violations um, and um, particularly in kind of fostering social cohesion um, and allowing adolescents to kind of be more aware of their rights, um, how to kind of access them and, and respect the rights of others. Um, but thanks very much um, for this great webinar. Thank you very much. Kenan and Megan, and over to Elsa. Thanks, Elisa. Um, well, I don't. Yeah. Well, thank thank you again very much for this opportunity. I I, I think. We, we can probably, I saw the number of requests from participants to, to replicate this kind of uh, discussion at the at the, the regional level or, or very much support this, this idea. Um, I would say that th there's a number of opportunities that we have through the engagement with the, the, protect, the, the field protection clusters, uh, including this uh, work that um, we're doing all together on, on the protection and analytical framework, for example, or really to, to, to mainstream the human rights-based approach uh, as much as um, we are, as far as we are, we are involved in the in at the field level so very happy to, to continue to support that and and as and then again is as, as syria is is concerns um, um a lot of uh, possible discussion with the the protection cluster here so thanks again elisa and and uh, and valerie thanks over to you thank you very much elsa for participating and over to elena Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe my uh, just a, a little uh, reflection uh, at the end of this um, um, session. Uh, we, we need to be clear that human rights education is one intervention out of many other interventions that can address a problem in a specific situation for specific people. Right. Uh, so human rights education and training does not happen in a vacuum and is going to be the, you know, the solution to all problems. Uh, among other interventions, there are many. There are human rights monitoring and investigations, um, human rights advocacy, uh, institutional reform to make sure that human rights principles are embedded in institutions, in their uh, policies, but also in their practices and so on. So uh, let's not be uh, uh, unrealistic, but 
But on the other side, through all this work we have been doing, for instance, in the office in documenting good practices uh, um, in the area of human rights education, uh, one thing that I may say that when uh, human rights education is well uh, conceived, when it's uh, uh, implemented in a methodologically sound way, when it focuses on the learners and on an assessment of their learning needs, rather than on what the trainers know and want to bring to, to somebody, human rights education can really work. Um, uh, we have seen, uh, uh, for those of you where uh, uh, I know Elisa was involved, uh, in Geneva, we have seen uh, um, uh, young children coming from very disadvantaged <laughs> and uh, uh, vulnerable communities. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about the story of uh, India, where um, uh, uh, there were some children who went through this human rights education program um, in uh, uh, villages where female infanticide, for instance, used to be a practice. Right, just the girl being born a female, or you know, knowing that there was a, a, a girl being to be born was uh, um, there was a practice of uh, killing. Uh, so in this kind of uh, situations, so we have seen the human rights education program bringing a change, starting from the children who at school were learning about human rights and girls' rights, uh, moving to the parents of these children because the children would bring this issue uh, home and from the parents going out to the village and changing these practices. Uh, and just to give you an example, a child who t more than 10 years ago went through one of these human rights education program. Uh, two years ago, she came to the uh, UN to speak against uh, um, caste discrimination in education, for instance, in, uh, in India, uh, speaking to the Human Rights Council. So this is to say, taking uh, again uh, a good understanding that human rights education is not the only solution. When it's well done, it is part of the solution. So very much uh, um, encouraging you to get more and more involved in this area. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we are at your uh, uh, disposal for any assistance we can provide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, Valerie, would you like to? Thank you so much, uh, Elisa and colleagues, dear participants and panelists. I think uh, um, the discussion proves uh, how much there is yet to be done and uh, what is the scope of how we can really use the human rights education going forward in humanitarian settings. Examples such as Makani is a very good one. Not the only one, of course, but uh, yet much to be done. And as it was said, uh, the Human Rights Engagement Task Team will be in touch uh, and we hope to provide you with more resources, tools, opportunities to engage and exchange around uh, this topic. So we would be happy to um, bring you on board. As if you are interested, please get in touch. Thank you so much, Elisa. Over to you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and thank you very much again for uh, your time in participating. I just would like to conclude by saying that indeed there are really um, these practices that are not known. I mean, I see here Julia Caponi, she's from uh, um, an NGO called Vento di Terra. It's a very small NGO that also works in Jordan, but actually they also do human rights education. So I would really encourage these uh, good practice somehow to be shared because that's what we really need. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, and hope to continue this discussion discussion with you all. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Up to you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.